there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost, and I'm gonna share with you a recipe for Swedish fish boil. So grab a pencil and a piece of paper. We'll also take you on a steelhead fishing trip in the winter and a lot more because it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again. And all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Well, Ed, you know, last Friday night was Michigan Outdoors Night at Outdoor Rama. It was a lot of fun, Fred. It sure was. It was a little different, too. Let's go down to Michigan Outdoors Night with our cameras and see what was different about it. Hope all of you people have had a chance to see Michigan Outdoors on television. Well, the obvious thing here, Ed, we're playing in front of a live audience. We don't get to do that very often here in the Michigan Outdoors cabin. But that was quite a thrill to have thousands of people up in the stands. And we had a number of uh, celebrities, people who were on Michigan Outdoors. And I was also explaining a little bit about my background in outdoor TV. In about 1968, I started working for Mort Neff. Quite a thrill it was. Of course, I was just out of college. I was 21 years old and he was 65 and uh, boy, I thought I knew a lot more than he did. Well, I learned some things over the years. My show now that I do on Channel 56 and on eight other public TV stations is patterned after Morton Neff's program, Pace and Variety, a lot of different features within the show every week. But the one thing is, Michigan Outdoors is sticking to hunting and fishing sticking to the hardcore outdoors. I love doing the show and I'm proud to be a sportsman. And I hope you all enjoy the show. I want to bring up some people here who make outdoor, Michigan Outdoors work. Now you see these fellas on probably every other week. Tim Eater and Ray Rustum, they've uh, debated on several issues. Yeah, we've uh, done debates, of course, with uh, Tim, Ray, and also Wayne Schmidt, who couldn't make it down here uh, on Friday night. But a lot of people have wondered if Ray and Tim and Wayne uh, really have the attitudes that they portray. So we were explaining to the audience that uh, actually it's sort of a setup. We go through the issues, and, and part of the function is to try to bring these controversial subjects out, show both sides, so uh, our audience can understand a little more about... Uh, what these issues involved in the outdoors. And which one is going to take con? Right, Ray? That's pretty much what we do. We just kind of do some homework on the thing and uh, try to bring out the major points of the issue, just uh, more for an educational thing than anything else. And, of course, there are other people we have on Michigan Outdoors uh, who are the controversial people themselves. One of them, of course, is the DNR director, Dr. Howard Tanner, and he came down here to do a seminar and talk to the public on Michigan Outdoors night. Remember that the state of Michigan led the battle on DDT, and the state of Michigan led the battle on PCBs, and those lakes and waters are essentially clean, and those fish are safe to eat. Go out there and enjoy them. And, of course, the uh, controversial issue about are the fish safe to eat, we're going to be talking a little bit about that right at the end of the program here when we do our Swedish fish boil. But uh, Dr. Tanner and the, the celebrities like this and the MUCC people, uh, all the people who play on the show are really important, as well as a fellow from the Cooperative Extension Service who's on every week with his wildlife friends. Wildlife in this state, especially wildlife, and he's bringing something up here that is reminiscent of Mort Neff's program every week for 23 years when Mort was on the show. The show opened with a raccoon. Now this is a raccoon held by Glenn Dutterer, who's a wildlife expert who brings us a lot of different creatures every week. Glenn, you want to tell us something about raccoons, don't you? Well, it's uh, an unusual animal in that it's the only member of its family in Michigan. When you say the raccoon family, you mean raccoons. and There isn't any other member. The closest relative is the ringtail uh, and the Cotamundi of the southwest and most people have trouble believing this is a relative of the giant panda bear you know the black and white teddy bear that that we see of china and of the the lesser panda of china too now raccoon season is approaching we're not talking about raccoon hunting season but glenn dutterer works with the michigan state cooperative extension service and he says that some of you in this audience if you live in the detroit area may be paid a visit by a raccoon in about a month or so how come glenn well, for me, uh, April is raccoon month because uh, raccoons are very numerous in urban areas and they run out of tree dens 
And so they often select human houses as a place, particularly the females, to have young. And the fireplace chimneys and garages and areaways are excellent den sites for female raccoons. And long about the 1st of May, baby raccoons can get very noisy. And that's often when I hear about their raccoons or there's an animal in my fireplace. And that's how, why April and May are raccoon months for me. Well, keep your ears open for raccoons. Call the Extension Service, Glenn Dutter. He'll tell you how to get rid of them if you have animal problems like that. Thank you very much, Glenn. Rod Lawrence, come up here, Rod. We had somebody on the show last night who is the MUCC, Michigan Wildlife Artist of the Year. This man deserves a round of applause. A young man who, stand around here. Why don't you hold up this print right here? This is a special print. This, and turn around with it. This is the wildlife print of the year this year that Rod painted was selected out of over 80 wildlife prints, a pair of ruffed grouse. We'd love to be able to sell you a print. MUCC sold about 750 prints so fast they went like hotcakes. This guy is one heck of a wildlife artist. He'll be here tonight and all weekend. He has a booth in the back by the craft area. A, a real charming fellow, and I tell you, a wildlife artist who knows wildlife firsthand. Thank you, Rod. Of course, all those people, Ed, are the stars of Michigan Outdoors. People say that you and I are the stars, but it takes a lot of people to put this show on the air. Uh, all our friends out there who send in their photos, who come on the show with big fish and big buck racks, and we can't forget the people who really keep us on the air. I hear Dick Melke from Safari Club International, the Detroit chapter has uh, you know, shot a little money our way to keep us going, and there's been a lot of people, underwriters, and uh, individual who's, who have contributed uh, all the mounts here on the set and our kitchen and a lot of things to go with it. We wanted to show appreciation to them on Michigan Outdoors Night, and we did. And, uh, well, that was a real kick, don't you think, Ed, playing in front of a live audience? It was a real difference than being in the studio, Fred. A lot of fun. It sure was. And that was it, Michigan Outdoors Night at Outdoor Rama. The economy is also looking bad, so I'm out there selling the best I can. I would like you to come by our Michigan Outdoors booth. One thing you can do... So what would really help us, MUCC is, is having a sportsman's recognition banquet, March 13th. The proceeds from this will go to help support Michigan Outdoors TV show, which we sorely need. It's going to be a night that's an I'm proud I'm a sportsman night. Hunters and fishermen there, we're going to hand out the Master Angler Awards, the Big Buck Awards, and I hope you'll bring your wife, your girlfriend, your family, your friends, whoever. Come on out and support the show. We love y'all. We're proud to be sportsmen, and I hope you are too. Thank you very much. Well, that was one of the rare times Michigan Outdoors is on stage. But uh, let me say something more about the Michigan Outdoors uh, Sportsman's Banquet through MUCC on March 13th. I know that this, it's right around the corner. Here's what you can do to get tickets right now. You don't have to wait and send through the mail. Call us right after this show. Ed and myself, we're going to be on the phones. Call 517-353-2323. Call, collect. Now, we're going to flash this up again at the end of the show. You give us a call. We can get you tickets right away for the Sportsman's Banquet. And like I said, Ed and I will be answering the phone right after this show is done. Well, Ed, we also had some hot issues done at Outdoor Ram, our seminars and debates. Yeah, the one on snagging, the rafters were packed. And I interviewed some of the audience members, and they had some comments, both pro and con. I just kind of wonder if the definition of a sportsman has been changed since the snagging's been around. Well, why should it be? Well, I, I don't think the uh, idea of a sportsman would be tearing fish out of the water. That would be the same as running all our deer herd into a feedlot and machine gun them down. Well, now, how is snagging different than, say, spearing a fish or using a bow and arrow for fish? I think snagging, just the whole violent activity of it, is, is uh, repulsive to me. Do you think there's any skill in snagging? I don't think so. It's if a fish is there and your hook happens to be there, it's together. There's no skill in luring a fish into the be hooked by the side. Yeah, I've been snagging for about five years now, and I mean, you go up there, people, they go up there to have a good time. I mean, I wouldn't say it's the easiest way to catch a fish, you know. I mean, they say they just ripping them apart and stuff, but uh, like they say, the fish are going to die. You know, I'm uh, thankful for all the tuna fish I've made out of salmon, I'll tell you that right Where now. do you normally catch your fish? I mean, in the, what part of the body do you usually hook your fish? Side, tail. You're not going to catch it in the mouth. I mean, there's no way, you know. But I mean, the fish are going to die, and... Uh, I haven't bought tuna fish in about three years now because I've made it out of salmon every, every year. So, you know, I'm thankful for that, if nothing else. I like to ask some of the pro snaggers, uh, you know, for years and years, uh, we didn't have any fish here in the state of Michigan worth catching. 
the water was so bad. Now we clean up the waters. The sport fishermen pay to have those fish planted. Uh, how long is it going to be before they start to snagging Atlantic salmon? We snag every year. A hundred salmon every year. I have yet to hit a brown trout, a steelhead, a pike, a bass in three years. Where they go, I don't know. But when the salmon come in, everything else moves. It's like a raccoon leaving when an elephant comes through the jungle. Uh, you know, I, he may not have caught any, but I've been up there when snaggers have ripped the bellies out of brown trout and steelhead. I've seen walleye and perch and everything else hung on big, huge treble hooks. I am uh, definitely against snagging, and uh, I believe that maybe they should have their own area if they could control it. But my experience has been with it, it's very uncontrollable. And uh, I fish like in the later months of the year, like no, uh, December, November. I fish a river that is close to the Asabo River. <laughs> the overflow of snaggers in that time of the year is unbelievable. I fish brown trout, there are times you can't get near the river. They have to do something with it, they have to control it. However they go about it, I don't know. I guess the best way to do it is just to simply uh, do away with it completely. So completely eliminate snagging. Yes, it's, you're getting down to quality. You're talking quality versus quantity in, re in the realm of fishing. I mean, that's what it is. And uh, I think it's better to have quality than quantity. The salmon are there, they're gonna die. They may as well hook them, can them, smoke them, give them to the old folks, fish chowder, I don't care. Well, that's a stormy issue, Fred, and I'm sure that's not the last we've heard of that. Oh, definitely not. But, you know, speaking of storms and speaking of fish, even on a miserable, blustery day like today, there's fishermen who are out on the streams catching steelhead trout, hooking them in the mouth legally. You don't believe it? You really wouldn't think there'd be any fishermen who were so enthusiastic about their sport that they'd brave the wind and sleet and snow just to fish, but there are a few. The two dedicated steelhead fishermen I fished with on this blustery winter day were John Hesse and Jim Bedford, both steelhead fishing experts from Lansing. What do you wear on a day like this? Well, this is what I wore. I wore three pairs of socks, a couple lighter ones under wool socks, a pair of fishnet long johns covered with a pair of waffle weed long johns, a pair of corduroys, then my waders. Up top it was a fishnet shirt, covered with a long-sleeved waffle weave undershirt, then a flannel shirt, then a sweatshirt, then an old ski sweater, and a good warm jacket with a hood. I didn't want to get cold. I put a knit hat on to keep my ears warm, a pair of knit gloves, a spare pair of mittens, and a scarf around my neck. Believe me, I was not overdressed. I was comfortable. The 15-minute hike through the snow finally brought us to the banks of our steelhead stream. Now, this is a favorite of Jim's and John's, so I'm not going to reveal exactly where we are right now. But I will point out uh, some of the better steelhead streams at the end of the show that are around the state where you can do some winter fishing. Now, both Jim and John are spinner fishermen. They use spinner lures that flash as they retrieve, imitating silvery minnows that dash and dart in the current. Now, John prefers using a closed face spinning reel. No gloves if it's warm enough. Of course, it's never really warm in January. That's the closed face wheel right there, but uh, Jim Bedford, on the other hand, prefers to fish with an open-faced spinning reel. And he almost always never wears gloves, even in the most frigid weather. But that isn't the sign of a die-hard steelhead fisherman. I don't know what is. Now, there are fish to be caught in these frigid waters. It's not only exciting sport, but it's a beautiful time of year, as long as you're dressed to enjoy it. Now, fishing like this in the middle of the winter is a popular outdoor sport in Michigan, but most fishermen do it through the ice, usually on an inland lake or on the Great Lakes. Grand Traverse and Saginaw Bays are popular spots, but stream fishing using fall and spring techniques can be very productive if the streams aren't frozen over. Right here, John Hesse is sliding over shelf ice. That's ice that's attached to the shore and extends partway into the river. If the shelf ice is fairly thick, no problem, but you never know if the shelf ice is going to support your weight or dump you in. That's one reason it's always a good idea to fish with a pal. This type of fishing is just like you do in the fall or spring, slowly wading upstream, casting towards the submerged logs and brush, Bring your lure by the pockets and eddies and behind rocks and in the deeper holes where the steelhead are lurking. Fish don't like to expend a lot of energy battling the current if it isn't necessary, so they'll be behind the obstructions out of the fast-moving current. 
And in this cold water, steelhead won't go too far to hit a lure. You have to work the lures in close to where these trout are if you want to entice them into taking a crack at your lure. In this river, you can see where the water levels have receded over the past few weeks. Ice had formed around this clump of trees midstream, and as the water levels fell, new ice formed at a lower level. This handiwork of nature is intricate and beautiful. You know, walking through Mother Nature's art gallery in the winter is just one side benefit of winter fishing. Not too many people get out to these streams to see the wildlife and ice formations, and maybe that's another benefit, the solitude. Every now and then you'll see the remains of a coho or chinook salmon that has completed its life cycle and is naturally decaying on the stream bottom. Salmon only live to be three or four years old and it's their destiny to die after spawning. Steelhead are found in the same rivers and streams where you find salmon, but they don't die after spawning. If they're lucky, they'll be back several years in a row to spawn and they're an exciting fish to catch. Steelhead are an unusual fish in that they're basically a rainbow trout, but for some reason this strain of rainbow trout migrates to the Great Lakes like the salmon. And like the salmon, they grow to five, maybe ten pounds before returning to their home stream to spawn. But unlike salmon, they don't die after spawning. And unlike salmon, they usually spawn in the spring, not in the fall. But for some reason, about 20 or 30 percent of the steelhead come up the spawning streams in a normal fall, and they spend the winter here waiting for the waters to warm in March and April, which triggers their spawning activity. And maybe you've heard that salmon and steelhead trout don't eat while they're in the streams on their spawning runs. Well, that's correct, apparently. You'll almost never find a steelhead trout with food in its stomach while it's in a river. Then the logical question is, why do they hit a lure? Well, who knows? Fisheries biologists are as baffled by this as anyone. It appears that they strike because they're aggravated by an intruding fish, and they don't really intend to eat it. But then why will they also pick up spawn bags or eggs or other natural baits? Well, who knows? Evidently, it's just a bad habit they got into in the spring and summer and fall when they were hungry. In any case, even though they aren't feeding while they're in the streams, they will hit lures and baits, and that's good enough for most fishermen. Now, I hope all this doesn't look too easy. There are problems with winter fishing. Now, for example, right here, Jim is snagged in the brush. But he's been snagged in the brush so many times, he doesn't lose patience. He knows how to work that lure loose. He also knows this river like the back of his hand, and he knows where most of the snags are. And of course, his casting technique is a highly polished art. Now, John Hesse is aware of the hazards of shelf ice, and as he walks towards the bank, watch the lower left. <laughs> You gotta be careful for things like that. Now, frozen guides on your fishing rod are another difficulty, especially on the colder days when they might ice up after only two or three casts. There's only one way to solve this. Put the guide in your mouth and melt the ice. It seems to be the quickest and most efficient way, especially with the smaller guides. The largest guides, it's relatively simple to break the ice out with your fingers. Now you can always use your mouth uh, to hold spare parts for your reel if you need to stop streamside and make a few repairs. Not the best conditions. But John had some difficulty with his reel freezing up. You can tell he's an experienced fisherman. He carries spare parts along with the tools he needs to make the repairs. Here's an age old problem familiar to fishermen. You've hooked the bottom. If you play it just right, you might be able to pull it loose, get your lure back. On the other hand, it might be a lost cause, you never know. Now here's a rare shot. You'll see a fisherman whose lure is snagged on the bottom while he is snagged on a tree by his suspenders.
Well, you gotta hand it to Jim Bedford. In weather like this, he still doesn't lose his cool, even though he loses his lure. But with Jim and John for that matter, there are a lot more lures where those came from. Both fellows are serious spinner fishermen. They lose a lot of spinners in the brush, so they buy the components in large quantities and make their own spinners for only a fraction of what they'd pay if they bought their spinners already packaged. Jim and John both keep meticulous records of their fishing trips. In a normal year, Jim Bedford will log over 250 hours in the water fishing for steelhead. And he'll catch 50, 60, 70, even 80. That's a darn good average, too good as you'll find anywhere, and you're watching exactly how he does it. Now the score is two to one. Jim has two steelhead on his stringer, John has one. But before Jim could get his line back in the water, there was a cry of fish on, and now John has his hands full. Well, it could be that Jim's hands were cold. His first netting attempt came up empty, but a second try netted a beautiful steelhead that any fisherman would be proud to take home. This particular day did turn rather cold. When we got into the stream at 8.30 in the morning, the temperature was close to 30 degrees. But during the day, we saw two or three inches of snowfall. We felt the winds kick up, and by four in the afternoon, the temperature was only 10 degrees. And we decided that we had enough for one day on the river. But that's what it's like steelhead fishing with lures in the streams in winter in Michigan. What to do with the salmon and steelhead trout that you catch, Ed? Right. I have a simple recipe here. We have a couple minutes. Let me get dressed up in my chef's regalia here. This is our first recipe we're cooking in the Michigan Outdoors cabin here. This is for a Swedish fish boil. Get a pencil and a piece of paper. I'm sure you can remember this, though. The first thing you do, you get about, oh, uh, six quarts of water, put it in a pot on the stove, and take about, oh, two potatoes per person. If we were just cooking this for ourselves, this is what I'd put in, Ed. Two potatoes in this water. Turn it on high and bring this baby to a boil. Now, when it gets boiling, Ed, now you add one cup of salt. Okay. Now, there's two cups right there. It sounds like a lot of salt, but believe me, you add one cup of salt in there, a little more. Let that boil for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes of the potatoes boiling, add the onions, one or two onions per person. Okay. There we go. And let those boil for an additional 10 minutes. So that's 20 minutes altogether. 20 minutes altogether. Now what we do, we bring in the fish. When that's boiled 20 minutes, add the other cup of salt. Okay. Sounds outrageous, doesn't it? Two cups of salt. Believe me, this salt has a function, which I'll explain in a minute. And now we take the fish. Now these are steaks from a steelhead trout, which Jim Bedford caught. Now, if you're concerned about contaminants or anything like that in the fish, you can skin them and use fillets. We have fillets in our, our fish boiling kettle. Right there are some steaks. Now, this, this obviously isn't uh, you know, the ideal setup with a Dutch oven and a colander like that. And we have a fish boil kettle right here, which is designed specifically for fish boils. And this is done. The fish is done. Ed, let me get you some plates here. You okay. scoop this out. And uh, while you're doing that, right. before we taste it, let's move right along here to our weekly trophy report. Just for the record, here's John Hesse again, who we just saw winter steel heading. This time it's September. He has 100 pounds of Chinook salmon on his stringer. That's a limit. And he caught him in a half day on the same northwestern Michigan River that he steelheads on. Now, not snagged, these salmon were all hooked in the mouth on spinners.
And here's his 12-year-old son, Jay Hesse, who caught this 10 and a half pound steelhead last October 23rd, same stretch of river, and he was also using a spinner just like dad. And don't think kids can't catch him. Nine-year-old Steve Walgren from Ypsilanti wrote me a letter that said, tonight I saw your program and saw a picture of a six-year-old who caught a 16 pound salmon. Thought you might like seeing the 21 pounder I caught last July off Saugatuck. Well, Steve, that's great. Just hold it up just a, just a few more seconds. And not to be outdone, in the Junior Master Angler Competition, Derek Belanger, who's 10 years old, sent in this photo of a 24-pound, 6-ounce Chinook he caught off Port Hope in Lake Huron last August. I think we ought to make all three of these kids our Master Anglers of the Week. Now, if you're interested in steelhead fishing right now, I, I gotta warn you that the fall steelhead run was not a great one. So the Betsy, the Little Manistee, the Big Manistee, uh, the Ossobble, some of these favorite steelhead streams have been kind of slow this year, very slow as a matter of fact. Now here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour some lemon butter over the potato and over this fish that just came out of the Swedish fish boil. Mm. Try that, tell me if you don't think it's absolutely scrumptious. Some people say it tastes like lobster. The reason is the salt, this big concentration of salt we put in here does you a couple- taste it. You can't, you can't taste, taste the salt. Can't taste the salt, and you mm. really can't taste the fishy stuff. The fishy smells and the oils are right in the pot there in the water, so dispose of that carefully. Isn't that great? That's oh, great, Fred. Scrumptious way to fix uh, fish, steelhead, salmon, a lot of those kind of fish, and we'll send you the recipe. And Thank isn't you. Isn't that great? One thing, there is a steelheaders banquet, or, or not banquet, a um, show this weekend in Flint, and speaking of a banquet, March 13th in Livonia, call this phone number tonight. Call us. Hope you enjoyed the show. See you next week. Try that there, Ed. Funding for the preceding program was made possible in part by a grant from Farm Bureau Insurance Group and its agents throughout Michigan. Shore and woodlands of the north, its history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan